So, um, my name is Brian Nisbet. I'm the Network Operations Manager in HEANET. Um, and I want to talk to you about um, what happens when a dragon destroys your data center. Uh, so, look, I'm assuming that all of you have well tested and worked out BCP and DOR plans. Yeah, all of you, every single one of you, yeah. And importantly, a plan isn't, is, is worth absolutely nothing unless you test it. Um, so if you've got a plan which is sitting beautifully in bound paper or in a wiki file, it means absolutely nothing unless you test it. So when you test it, when you go through these scenarios, um, this is what this talk is about. Um, because humans do two things. And I think where we are this evening shows one of them. We tell stories and we play games. If you don't think you do that, you're lying to yourself. Um, we tell stories all the time, the gossip around the water cooler, chatting, what you do at work today. Um, and we play games all the time, whether it's computer games, whether it's um, just board games, whether you're unfortunately one of those people who's still stuck playing Monopoly this Christmas. I apologize, much better games out there. Um, so I play a lot of games. Um, and one of the things that I play is role-playing games. So Dungeons & Dragons is something you've possibly all heard of. Uh, but there's a lot of them out there. And really, this is what, what we're talking about here. It's how to use those, those games with all these funny dice and things like that for your D or your BCP scenarios. Because in the 1970s, someone went, OK, we've been role-playing vaguely for years. And that's what you're doing in a scenario, you're role-playing. But they codified it. They turned it into a game, Dungeons and & Dragons. And then lots more people started writing all these systems. And you can play horror games, sci-fi games, fantasy games, real world games. Um, and you've got millions of people playing thousands of games. People think about it a lot. People do a lot of writing about it. Um, people, so you get a lot of information, a lot of hints and tips and tricks out of this. And so this is what we're, what we're, we're talking about. This is kind of trying to impart what I shall loosely refer to as wisdom um, to you in regards to what I have spent a lot of my time doing over the last 30-ish <laughs> years or something like that. Um, and, and things that you can apply. And hopefully, one of the big things is these games are all about engagement. They're all about people having fun, but keeping a bunch of people engaged. And that's really something you want to do with your, role, with your scenario, with whatever scenario you want. So you're sitting down, and I'm going to assume for a moment you're the person who's planning the scenario and doing all of this. And you've got to come up with something. So the first really important thing is that, I wonder, is there any chance that scrolls? It doesn't do that. No, it doesn't. OK. Um, you've got to come up with your world. You've got to come up with your scenario. Now, one of the things that engineers are really bad at is having a decent willing suspension of disbelief. So you have to come up with a scenario that is that works, that people will actually believe, people will stay engaged through. And they won't just sit there and go, well, obviously, if the dragon had destroyed the data center, that service wouldn't have gone down. What kind of noob are you? So it's got to be realistic. It's got to be something of interest to people. Um, and yeah, so you set that up, think about that, work something out properly. Now, the other thing is that your colleagues, like any player of any game, Two things. They're fundamentally both very intelligent, hopefully, and evil. Any plan, the first thing that any games master in a game realizes is any plan you come up with will not survive contact with your players. It is a fundamental piece of, of knowledge. So you've got to assume that whatever you set up, whatever worlds you set up, whatever events, they will hit roadblocks. You will say, this thing happens. And one of your, one of your team will go, I know I wrote a script last week that solves that entire problem. We're done. Pizza and beer for all. Um, so when you write this down, when you write your scenario, don't write it too strictly for two reasons. One, it will break. And two, your colleagues, if they feel like they're being railroaded, they feel like they're not having choice or ability to play, they will again, they'll disengage from that and they just won't be, they won't be interested. So make sure there's a great phrase if you're going to wing it, at least have a flight plan. Um, so, so think about this. Don't be too strict. Don't be too loose. Somewhere in the middle, like all of the best things. Importantly, your players, your colleagues, 
should feel like they're having to actually use their brains to work through a scenario. You want to make it difficult. You want to make this interesting. You don't want to just go, uh, yeah, one of the core readers has fallen over. And it's like, oh, I'll bring support, or I'll fix it myself, or we'll throw a new line card in. That's all boring. Uh, we did a great scenario at an event I was in, 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 in uh, a couple of weeks ago where hundreds of thousands of students were doing a really important exam. You were providing the network, and I worked for a National Research Education Network, and things started going wrong. So you had the Minister for Education ringing, you had journalists ringing, all of this kind of stuff. Uh, the analogy for us in Ireland would be the CAO results. Um, both my favourite and least favourite day of the year, every year. Um, but you don't want that challenge to be impossible. Because again, if people can't figure their way out, if they can't feel they can troubleshoot through it, then they'll disengage as well. They'll be like, eh, this is impossible. We're not meant to succeed. Nobody, apart from Captain Kirk, likes the Kobayashi Maru. Um, really, it's, I, I, yes, fine, you're realizing that some things you can't solve. That's a really boring way of spending your afternoon. And you don't want people to be demotivated because you want any of these events to be a team building event as well, because the team is unquestionably the most powerful thing you have in any actual disaster scenario. Now that said, don't have to make it obvious. You don't have to give people a really like, here is all the syslog, here is all the information. People like a mystery. Uh, mystery games, escape rooms, which if you haven't done, really do escape rooms. They're phenomenal. More games, more stories. Um, you can leave mystery not only about what's happening, which is the obvious thing, but let it into people's heads about why something is happening. Why is the company being attacked today by this denial of service attack? Um, why did the fire prevention systems in the, in the data center fail? Uh, when we did a scenario um, the last year in HEANet, which was the first time they let me run it all on my own, <laughs> the fools, um, everyone was like, well, where's Brian? You know, where's, where's our network operations manager? And I was sitting in the room, but not obviously not as far as the scenario is concerned. And then I had one of our clients call up and say, so someone claiming to be Brian has just tried to get access to our, 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 our comms room here. And people were like, has he been kidnapped? What's going on? Until one of my colleagues was like, I, I ring his wife? It's like, yeah, it's all fine. We're just, we're just chilling. It's grand. But again, it's that little bit of mystery. People get a bit, get a bit interested. They dig further into the investigation. Um, and it gives them, it gives them spice. You know, it's a bit of spice for the whole thing. Sorry, I write too many speaker's notes. And I occasionally have to check what I've written on my phone. Um, so you want... Um, you want it to be to the participants to have some freedom as well, which is which is important. Uh, I talked about railroading, but also so in role playing games and things like that, you have a lot of magic, you have superpowers, whatever, all sorts of things like that. You don't have that here, so again, you can't pretend one of your players can't go. Ah, I wave my magic wand, or maybe you work in the kind of company where they can. And please, I'd like to work there. But again, I mentioned scripts, I mentioned things like that, I mentioned really cool ideas. Make sure that your colleagues get to exercise that, that, um, that knowledge, that expertise they have. Again, I'll say it again, it's about engagement. It's about fun. Really importantly, and, and, and you know, the fantastic um, introduction about uh, diversity and inclusion, you want to make sure there's something for everybody. You probably have someone in your team who's... The first person always in with a solution or the person who kind of comes up with the plan. One of the big problems you have in role-playing games at a table is you have one player quite often who's like, we go and do this. Um, and that's the first idea that comes into people's heads is often not the best one um, or the right one. So one of the things you have to do is try and make sure there's something in there for everybody in the scenario, whether that's, you know, that's as simple as for your network engineers and your system administrators and things like that. Or just make sure that everybody on the team feels like they have the ability to actually participate and, and um, input into the thing. Again, don't let one person dominate. It's a very easy thing to do, and it's, it's almost certainly going to be not the result of the scenario you want. Um, importantly, though, this is a game. 
Um, and moments of calm and quiet are good things. The, the well-being of your, of your employees is very, very important. Sure, get them into a slightly stressed situation. Make them feel like that they're, you know, they're having to really think about things and having to do things. But don't make them break. Don't make your, your team go at each other's throats because they're feeling too much of a stress situation. Um, it, it's really, really important that you give moments of calm, you give moments of peace and reflection, because really importantly, just when people think it's all nice and quiet, ninjas. Vitally important in any scenario. Now, your ninjas might be a UPS failing when it seems to be okay, or mains power, or that last desperately wheezing air conditioning unit dying. Um, or finally, you know, the, 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 the buffer on the line cards just reaching the top of it. It's keep people on their toes. Um, life isn't fair. Uh, and the disasters that you're likely to encounter are not going to go, oh, well, they need a five-minute break. Um, they're going to keep on hitting you. And randomness and bringing in those things and keeping people slightly unsettled, but also, again, engaged, um, and getting their brain fizzing is a really, really important point. Maybe you don't have actual ninjas coming in through the, uh, through the, through the window of the, of the office, unless you have a really big budget um, and really forgiving HR people. Uh, so I did mention the, the keeping people, your, your well-being, moments of calm. Also having the ability built in to call timeouts and, and letting your staff do so as well. Letting someone actually say, no, I need to step away from this. Because again, fundamentally, the long-term well-being of your staff is far more important than this scenario. And you'll learn something from that as well. And fundamentally, you want to have victory conditions. You want people to come together to try a thing and to win together as a team. Now, whether that involves them keeping the network up, having them storm the castle, um, rescue the prince. Uh, I've been watching a lot of She-Ra recently, and I, trust me, amazing, amazing show. Watch, watch this show. Um, but you want to make sure that it doesn't peter out. You don't just go, ah, yeah, you're all good now, and you can all go back to your desks. You want to make it something you want to give them a bit of information about what happened, give them some background story on the scenario, why things happened, explain, let them, let them give them enough information to deconstruct it in their own head and to decompress. So fundamentally, importantly, try not to slay the dragon. Dragons are lovely, lovely endangered creatures. What I would recommend from my point of view is to educate them either, you know, they're very intelligent, Make them a network engineer. Personally, I'd love them to get involved in academic networking. That's much better. But fundamentally, you want to convince them the data centers aren't that tasty. Um, and if they've got fillings in their teeth, all that bare metal is going to go horribly wrong. Um, but yes, so have a plan. Consider your employees. Keep them engaged. Keep everyone around the table involved. Keep them slightly unsettled. And make sure at the end they can all feel like they've got something They've leveled up. They've done a good job. Thank you very much. All right. Any questions for our non-Dragon Slayer, Brian here? Yes. I should be looking at the audience, not at Brian, when I, when I try Why for Why would you that? not look at me? It's like, like, uh, would you have a plant? So... There's a bunch of different ways in which you can do that kind of thing. Uh, one of the big things I like doing in these kind of scenarios is introducing a bit of real life as well as, as, as fake. The scenario that we did uh, last year, we had the scenario ongoing, and we had an actor come in to try and um, illicitly gain access to the comms room. You can also, of course, seed people with certain information. <clears throat> A plant is possibly going, you know, and again, it, it depends on what works for your scenario. But certainly, as far as I'm concerned, as the person setting it up, you're the one defining the rules. So, and that, that adds a bit, of, a bit of real world work into it. We'll really, some people will get unsettled by that because they're like, this isn't, you said this was a test, this bit isn't a test. But in general, I think people 
overall prefer that if they feel there's a bit of real life stuff in there as well. No? Any other questions? Oh. Hi, I'm Mick. Um, how effective have you found the, uh, the actual role-playing games when it comes to actually implementing your BCP or your DR plan? What, what do you mean? I mean uh, how, do, how does the team perform uh, in an actual uh, disaster situation? Do, do you see a, a marked difference? Do you see any relation to the games versus the real life scenario? Yeah. I mean, I think we haven't... We, thank God there's wood around here somewhere. We haven't had anything at the scale of a, uh, of a disaster scenario. But actually, when we had... Um, even when we had Storm Emma... Uh, earlier this year and we closed the office for three days because red weather warnings are something to pay attention to um it was it was easier to work off with the fact that people had had that experience of working through the plan and i think that all of the information that i've got both personally anecdotally and also from studies and things like that shows absolutely if you work through this in whatever kind of scenario um it, it improves things when when it happens in real life. And personally, because I'm such a big fan of games, I think that is, it's an amazing learning tool. And once people get that into their heads, it's much easier to do it in real life when you've practiced it a few times. So, yes. Okay. Oh. Hi, Brian. Sorry. Uh, Tom Smith. Uh, how do you deal with, you know, you were saying about something for everyone, but then you've got the guys who take, or sorry, people who tend to, let's say, be technically dominant and that might overbear on the other team members because they're more experienced or they have more certifications or they have more responsibility in the organization. How do you bring the others up and kind of attenuate them a bit to you know, step the fact back for a bit? I mean, the, e the easiest thing to do is, is physically separate people. Um, there's only so many things one person can deal with at a given point in time. So you kind of go, right, you're working on that. Actually, I'll tell you what, do you want to go into that room over there or even just, just go away over there? You work on that problem. Other things are happening. So you've got to come up. You've got to make sure the threat is, is or the, you know, the, the thing is multi-threaded sufficiently to allow for that. Or, or you just go, okay, that's great. Heard enough from you. <laughs> Somebody else. I mean, you, you, know, you can be that blunt because as a, you know, as a manager, sometimes you need to do that kind of thing. You just need to go, look, okay, cool. Let's, let's listen to somebody else for a second. Thanks, Brian. Cheers. Thank you very much, Brian. Thanks, Brian.